worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Through every storm, we'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do great. Things.
His promise is true. Though I speak to the mountain, oh, it's time to move. My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater. Who 
focus our hearts on you. Father God, accept our praise as we open our hearts to the word that you have for us. Speak to us this morning. God, we're listening. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And it's always our prayer that uh, God's spirit would speak to you. That is our prayer in every service as it is being uh, put together and uh, the anticipation of how God's uh, spirit will speak to us in song through the prayers that are offered by his people and uh, as his word is proclaimed. So I hope that whether you're here in person or watching online this morning, that uh, you have that sense of longing and wanting and even anticipation of how God is going to speak to your heart 
heart and uh, challenge you perhaps with uh, new understandings of, of his word and what that means for your life on a daily basis. We're so glad that you're here and we would love to be a part of helping you to discern the life of faith even more fully. And so we hope that during the service uh, or during the week uh, that whether it's uh, questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ or what it means to, as a follower of Christ, to be a part of a church family, we would love to come alongside and have a conversation with you about that. So we do hope that you would uh, just take the time to text FL Respond uh, to the number 833-571-3475 and we can follow up with you immediately and uh, help you with those uh, questions, help, help you to find those answers and we'll look forward to that. As we open our book uh, Bible this morning to uh, the book of Romans uh, in chapter 6, it may seem a bit odd speaking to a title of such a title, uh, speaking to a topic um, like our sermon title this morning where grace increases. I thought about that later because uh, Paul uh, has had the word from the Lord in 2 Corinthians uh, in chapter 12 and verse 9. The resurrected Christ has already said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So there's never a time when, when faith is lacking. There's never a time when grace, when God's grace is insufficient. My grace, he says, is sufficient for you. There's never a time that it is lacking. So what perhaps is needed more than anything else for us as the church, as followers of Christ, I think what is of great importance if we're going to talk about grace is to increase our understanding of grace and our appreciation for grace. And with this understanding and appreciation, what that means for the life that we are living on, on a daily basis. As we come to chapter 6 and verse 1, Paul begins with, uh, with a question. And in this question, you can see that he's anticipating some uh, potential or real objections. That based upon what he has just espoused and held forth regarding grace back in chapter 5, verse 20 and verse 21, uh, Paul probably has already heard some objections to this gospel that, that he is preaching. You remember that he said in verse 20, the law came in so that the offense would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, so also grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now then, whether it's real or imagined, Paul is anticipating some objections to this. What's been stated, he's anticipating some misconceptions. And so he frames this question in chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue? in sin so that grace may increase? Now, as we will see, Paul is completely dismissive of this question. He thinks it's a derogatory type of question, an accusation that's being made against him. And the preaching of this kind of gospel based upon God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so what Paul seemingly is trying to do is to raise our appreciation and to have an accurate understanding of what grace means and how that applies to your daily life. And the analogies that, that he will use, you'll see that in Paul's mind, this is something far-fetched. He says in verse 2, far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? It's incompatible in Paul's mind that if you really understand grace and appreciate grace, how would you even contemplate and imagine going back to the former life before you experience this grace? Well, we can apply it to our own lives, I think, but we can start with biblical characters. Let's, let's begin with someone like, like Zacchaeus, for instance. You remember Zacchaeus was a tax collector, hated, despised, loathed by, by his own people, considered to be a, a traitor. And you remember Zacchaeus climbed up this sycamore tree so that he could have a better view of Jesus as, as he came passing by. And, and Jesus hearkened to him. Jesus saw him and, and said to him, you know, Zacchaeus, hurry, come. I, I must dine with you in your house. And, and it says that Zacchaeus received him joyfully. 
Jesus, of course, was accused and maligned by the religious leaders of that day and time for, for dining with the sinner. But by the end of that, that meal, you know the rest of the story. Jesus said this to Zacchaeus, today, Zacchaeus' salvation has come to this house. Because you too are a son, he too is a son of Abraham. Remember the connection Abraham made, that Paul made back in chapter four? That what God has done in and through Christ Jesus is the, full, is, is the fulfillment of all the Abrahamic promises made back in the book of Genesis. And Zacchaeus, what God is doing, you're a part of that. As, as Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, Abraham, Zacchaeus, you're a part of that salvation. Now, having had that experience, could you imagine Zacchaeus a couple of years later saying, you know what? I think I'd like to go back to my old life. I think I'd hate to go back. I'd love to go back and being hated and loathed and despised. Or blind Bartimaeus, having the encounter with Christ, having his, his, his eyesight restored. Can you imagine Bartimaeus ever saying, you know, I wish I could just go back to life as it, as it used to be? Or what about the Gadarene demoniac in, in, in Mark's gospel in, in chapter 5? Here was a man who lived among the tombs. Here was a man that that was demonized. Here was a man that was tormented by by a legion of, 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 of demons. And after Jesus would cast them out, Jesus said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Could you imagine the gathering demoniac, this man that was delivered from such torment, some years later saying, you know what, I'd love to go back to that old life. Man, there's, there's nothing like living among the tombs. Could you imagine him wanting to go back to that kind of torment? Or what about the prodigal son, a story we all know well. This youngest son who asked for his share of, of the inheritance went and squandered it on, on wild living. And then he realizes the error of his ways and he comes back and he's shocked and, and that in his shame, his father is there running out to meet him and, and to welcome him and to throw a, a party for him, killing the fatted calf, much to the dismay of that eldest son. And you remember what, what the father would say, those, those words, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Could you imagine the prodigal son? After the party's over and life's just back to routine years later saying, you know what? I was thinking about this. I was thinking about that grace I experienced a few years ago. You know, I was, I was thinking about what a grand party that was that we had. You know what? What if this time, I want to go back and do it all over again. And this time, I'm, I'm going to pull out all the stops. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go over the top in my wild ride to sliving. Can you imagine what kind of party they'll throw for me then? Can't even imagine that, can we? For Paul, it is something that is unimaginable. And yet we have people in the church today, in the Western church especially, if not globally, that do that very thing we cannot imagine. Who have such a wrong, displaced understanding of, of this idea of grace. That they have misinterpreted and believe it to be something that gives them license to live as they want to live. That grace is somehow the get out of jail free card. You do whatever you want to do. I can do whatever I want to. God is obligated to forgive me. It is some, it is some kind of self-accommodating, self-fashioned vocabulary list and dictionary trying to define words that justify a life that they already long to live. 
I mean, if the desire of God was for us to remain sinners, to continue living lives that, that were counter and, and antithetical to the life that he would have us to live, if, he, if his desire was for us to continue to live in the domain of sin, then there would have been no need for Christ to have ever come or died. Paul can't even fathom this kind of of thinking. And yet there are a great many that abuse this grace card and and when sin is confronted and when sin is talked about, oh, they they take great offense that that the church all of a sudden isn't accommodating. And when sin is confronted and oh, they are quick to reply with the only three biblical words they know regarding God. Forgiveness, love, and grace. As if there are no other qualities that God possesses. Like righteousness, justice. The expectation that his people are to be a unique and distinctive people, a light under the world. And so as we come to chapter 6, and this is the, really the guts of, of what Paul is doing in this section of chapters 5 through, through 8, from, from chapter 6 and verse 1, going through chapter 7 and verse 16, what Paul is going to make clear to, to those who are, who are serious about being followers of Christ, he is going to make it obvious that, that the former life that we live, is simply incompatible, it does not register for those that are dead in Christ Jesus. That there is this expectation that when the new birth has been accomplished, when we have been born again, there is a new nature, there is a new allegiance, there is a new alliance, there is this new domain of mercy and grace and righteousness under which we are to live our lives as the people of God. So what Paul is doing here is he's going to elevate and increase our understanding and appreciation for this word grace. And thus with that understanding and appreciation, how it transforms our lives. Well, how does he do that? Well, he begins with the word of education and sound education. Now, you'll see the transition here. He says, what shall we say then? That in itself, this is is what's called a pedagogical question. That is is a question that is being floated out there. Uh, Pedagogy is the theory of teaching. And so it's a teaching tool, this pedagogical question. I'm, I'm posing this question so that it might be a teachable moment that it might be something that contributes to our education and and understanding as as a people of God. Now, we live in a day and time that that tends to focus on the emotive in the life of faith, that the genuine experience is measured by the amount of motion that you have. That's actually counter to, uh, to the teachings of Paul. Because, and we're going to see it more as the book of Romans unfolds, uh, Paul, Paul understands that the life of the mind, the formation of the mind is central to an appropriate understanding to the life of faith. And that appropriate understanding lends itself to the right actions, to the right life that is being lived. That we are not left to our whims, we are not left to our emotions, we are not left to our intuitive feeling. There is sound doctrine, there are sound theological understandings that guide us and instruct us in the things of God. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Far from it. This is ludicrous, Paul. Completely dismissive. Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know? That's an interesting phrase you might underline there because Paul Paul uses that phrase often in writing to the churches, or do you not know? And usually what, what Paul does, like a good teacher, a good preacher, you keep coming back to things and reminding people of what they already know, and you do that as a means of reinforcement. So most of the time when Paul says, or do you not know, 
He's referring to things that they already do know, but not in this case. Paul now is going to add teachings. He's going to add another layer to some things that, yes, they already understand, but now he's going to give them more of an education. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, a couple of things here I want to stop. This this is the first introduction of Paul in the book of Romans. This is the first time Paul introduces in the book of Romans this idea regarding the person of Jesus, his anointed role and title, that, that he is the Messiah. Now, the significance of of Jesus as the Messiah, as the anointed one, the Messiah is understood to be the representative of his people. And that's us. That, That what is true of Jesus, what is true of the Messiah, is true of us. And so this is something into which we have been incorporated, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, immersed into Christ. Now, the way Paul is using this word baptized, yes, in, in, in normal Hellenistic Greek, whenever you see the word baptizo or some derivative of, of, of what would be translated as baptized or baptism, that is usually, that is usually associated with, with um, some, uh, it's usually associated with water baptism. Uh, in, in fact, there, there are those that will lift this verse uh, out, of, out of context, this particular verse. Uh, they, they will see this as being some kind of sa- reinforcement for a sacramental theology. And in Hellenistic Greek, that is the normal use of this word. It is, it is associated with the sacramental act of water baptism, immersing, plunging someone underneath the water. But the interesting thing about the writings of Paul When Paul uses this word baptism, and especially in this context, he's not talking about the sacramental act of baptism. He's not talking about water baptism. He is using the word figuratively to talk about the idea of being incorporated into something. Paul would use the word the same way in a figurative way. In uh, 1 Corinthians, a couple of times, it's, it's found in 1 Corinthians 12, where it, it talks about us as believers that, that we are immersed into one body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. You go back earlier to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. He talks about the people of Israel being immersed into Moses. And so it's this idea of being incorporated into something. In fact, it wasn't until really after the patristic fathers that this idea of baptism was associated exclusively, at least in theological writings, that it was associated exclusively with the sacramental act of water baptism. But Paul is utilizing it here to describe something that is, bit, that is much bigger. We have been baptized. We have been incorporated into Christ. Our status has changed. And because we have been baptized into Christ, we have been baptized into his death. That is, what is true of him as the Messiah, as the representation of his people, what's true of him is true of us. These are theological realities that he's holding forth. We have been baptized. All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized unto his death. Therefore, verse 4, we have been buried with him. And what we need to note also is each of these verbs that he is using, baptized into Christ, baptized unto his death, and uh, being raised from the dead, united with him in verse 5. All of these are in the passive voice. And by that passive voice, it means this is something God has done. This is something God has done for you, for me, through Christ Jesus, not something of our own merit and our own work. 
Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism, through this incorporation. We have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Whenever you see Paul use that word walk, how we walk, he's talking about our ethics, our morality, our behavior, our actions. And so because you and I have been buried with Christ, because uh, our lives have been buried as as though we are as dead in Christ. And just as we have been buried with Christ underneath the cross and we have been raised with him, then we are to walk in the newness of life. Verse five, for we have become united. That is, we have become fused together, growing together with him. Perfect tense. That means continual and ongoing. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. You see how significant this is. How we need to be how we need to be open and how we need to grab hold of these theological realities, these theological truths that you and I are dead in Christ Jesus we have been buried with him underneath the cross raised up with him to walk in the newness of life and that it's perfect tense I think it beckons us I know it beckons me to think about am I dying daily if this is a perfect tense reality of the life that I'm to live in Christ Jesus because I'm now in him. Remember in Romans 5, Paul has set these two things in, against one another. In Romans chapter 5 last week, we talked about you can, either, you can either choose this way of life over here that's under the domain of sin and death, or you can choose this life over here that, that is based upon grace and righteousness and life eternal. And that's what Paul is holding forth. That's why it's incompatible, this idea that is being questioned that, uh, now Paul, are you saying that, that we send all, that we should send more, that grace might abound all the more? No, this is something that is transformational. The old person no longer, the old Adam, the, the old person no longer exists. You've been buried. You've been raised up to walk in the newness of life. But along with this, Paul adds a freeing implication. That if you embrace this teaching, if you you embrace these biblical truths and this significant part of your discipleship as followers of Christ, then you need to understand there is a freeing implication that comes with this, with this knowledge and this this understanding. He says in in verse 6, knowing this, and again, there's nothing unspiritual about knowing He's coming back to the mind. Remember, by the time we get to chapter 12, he's going to challenge us to be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. Knowing this, knowing what what I've just established and understanding this, this new biblical teaching for you, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, buried underneath the cross with them, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for the one who has died is freed from sin. Now, Paul sees sin as a personality, that before Christ we were prisoners, we were slaves, We lived under the dominion. The master was was sin. And the context of Paul's writing may have far greater meaning for them than it does for us today. But Paul's essentially pointing out that death is the great liberator. That what has been accomplished in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus for you and you being buried with him, that you're now liberated. You're living under a a completely new domain. Your life has been reformatted in Christ Jesus. 
Now, in that first century ear, they would have heard Paul using the language of slavery. Back in ancient days, it was kind of an odd arrangement in that even if a slave, and there, it's been estimated that three-fifths of the Roman population was of, an, was of an, an indentured status. They were slaves. And even those, that, even those that were able to purchase or buy their freedom or even those that were granted freedom, it was a strange thing in that, in that the former masters still had some, some rule and reign over them. And the ancient slave, even though he may have been granted freedom, in the truest sense really was not freed, liberated, until he died. That's the analogy that Paul is making. You have been liberated. We, as followers of Christ, understand this. He says, you have been liberated from the domain and the master of sin. You have been freed in death. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe. Again, belief. For if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing, verse 9, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you too, here's the implication. What has been said preceding has very real implications. So you too, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's the implication based upon everything that's been said about being dead in Christ, being buried with him, so you too. You consider yourselves to be dead to sin. That word consider is a bookkeeping term. It means to calculate. It has to do with the mindset. This needs to be your mindset as you approach the life of faith. Listen, I know we're in a war. I know we're in a battle. I know the flesh continues. The old master tries to get dominion over you. But if you want victory, you need to consider, you need to calculate who you are. Be true to who you are. This is who you are now in Christ Jesus. Calculate it. Do the math. Look at the th- preceding theological realities. Paul's tell- uh, You think Paul's going to lie to us? Embrace your identity. Do the math. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You want victory in the life of faith? Remember who you are. Yeah, but Bobby, the old man. No, the old man's dead. He's been buried. Remember who you are. Yeah, Bobby, the old Adam, man. You know, yeah, I know. He's, he's buried. I know where he is. He's buried. He's at Calvary. You're dead with him. Now, are you truly dying to self? That. That may be part of the confusion sometimes. We could easily compare our lives and evaluate our lives if we're honest. Are we really dying to self? Luke 9, 23, are we picking up our cross daily? Are we truly dying to self? Or with the passage of time, is is the old man creeping back in? Are you allowing that that voice to to make your life more self-serving? Are you more self-consumed? Instead of dying to self, are you, are you always, always just looking out for number one? Paul says you're free. Be true to who you are. Believe. Paul is going to great lengths to educate that we might be of sound mind as to who we are. Listen, church, the life of faith, the life of faith isn't about closing your eyes and just enforcing yourself to believe the impossible. That's not faith. Faith is opening your eyes and embracing the realities of who you are in Christ Jesus. That's faith. 
opening your eyes and knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and living life accordingly. There's one final thing as Paul seeks to increase our understanding and appreciation of grace, not just giving to us a sound education and all of its freeing implications that go with it, but there also has to be a decisive application, a decisive, intentional application. And that's one of the things I love about Paul. He's a great theologian, but the greatness of his theology is that he makes it applicable. And so he says in in verse 12, therefore, Again, that wonderfully rich transitional word based upon everything that's been said. Therefore, let's get to the practical. Therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the parts of your body. And that word present, again, Paul will redress it in chapter 12 where he says to present our bodies as a living holy sacrifice, which is our reasonable spiritual service of worship. And so do not go on presenting the parts of your body. Paul oftentimes uses the language, 1 Corinthians 12 especially, the idea of body parts and, and us being the body of Christ together. So do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But here's what he says, make a de- another determination, make another choice, but present yourselves. You see, Paul's putting alternatives in front of you. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. I'm talking about living the resurrection life, not just in the sweet by and by, but even here in the ugly here and now. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, in your body parts as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now church, here's what we need to hear this morning about grace. Grace isn't just about the mercy of God. It is not a one-dimensional word. Grace is not just about the mercy of God. Grace is a power that transforms the human heart. When grace is rightly understood, when it is rightly appreciated, it is transformational. It is the great need and the great longing of humanity. The world is never surprised by God's judgment. What shocks the world is God's grace. And the world is starving for grace. There was an Italian novelist by the name of Ignazio Salone. He wrote a book years ago about a, a revolutionary He's being chased by the police. And the comrades of this revolutionary sought to hide him in the foothills of the Alps, among, just among peasants. And a part of their ploy was to dress this revolutionary as, as a priest and to bring him into this village under the cover of, of darkness. But word began to spread among those peasant people, among those villagers, word began to spread about a priest that was among him, among them. And they started lining up at the door wanting to confess. And he would try, the revolutionary would try to shoo them away and, 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 and try to push them away. But, but inevitably, as the lines grew longer outside his, his cottage, He finally had to just sit and listen to people telling their stories of brokenness, shame, and guilt, confessing their failures and their sins, of people who were starving for grace. Grace. 
it is imperative that we understand and appreciate grace. It has to be more than just something that points to the mercies of God. We must embrace it as something that is transformational and powerful in our own lives. Because we go out into the darkness as a people of light, we are going out into a world that is starving for grace. The same thing you start for and were given. And because you were given grace, you need to be a medium of grace into the world. Listen, on your worst day, you are never so bad that you are beyond the grace of God. And on your best day, you are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. So embrace it, seek it, live it, share it. Let's pray together. Father, how grace stirs us. How grace catches us off guard. How grace is still so unexpected. And Lord, we have to admit that often it's because we know ourselves. We have to look in the mirror every day. And we know who you are, but day after day after day, moment by moment, we have to crucify ourselves. And embrace the realities of what you have said and what you have determined about us in our lives. So, Father, I pray that we would be a people always, every day, in our time of being awake. That we would be a people who seek grace and a people who share grace with others. And that others might be drawn to you as your spirit of mercy prevails in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.